Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, listeners. Yeah. Welcome, watchers. Long time no see. Yeah, we missed an episode last week. Yeah, something we try not to make a regular occurrence, but... Yeah, we were on a, we were on a good clip, you know? We had uh, some momentum and um, just totally fizzled out last week. What happened? What did happen? Oh, you were gone. Yeah, you were gone. But it, it actually worked out. You know, there were some... It takes a lot of work to put this up on video. Like, a lot of work. It changed, it changed things. The, changed things. Yeah, for the better, for sure. But actually, one thing that I want to address is that... To the world? To the whole world. Oh, boy. To all the printheads. Okay. <laughs> is I recognize that as soon as we jumped on video, we started catering to the video and less so to just the audio only, only we listeners. We quit describing things well with our words. <clears throat> I think I think we did. Have you recognized I, that too? I have, yeah. So yep. I feel horrible about it. I do feel horrible about it. We can make things right. We'll we be can, better. We can correct our, our we'll wrongs. We'll be better. And uh, so in... <clears throat> To pay respects to that, we've brought no visual aids today. <laughs> to help to help remind us how to re-describe things with words. Yeah, we need to stay true to our roots and communicate verbally. Communicate just beautiful verbal landscapes. That's that's your job. <laughs> that's your job. You're I don't the think you're so. the wordsmith. No, that's not true. And we prove that. It was proven two two episodes ago. I have uh, a leather bound book at home mm. that teaches me these words <clears throat> mm. on occasion. So mm. let's plop it open, find a word, commit it to memory, kind of like how you did. I actually was really I liked that you opened up on that last episode. Yeah, because I had no idea about uh -huh. all like your efforts to learn as a kid. I thought yeah. that was really cool. All right, cool. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I don't talk about it, you know. Uh, why would I? It was like 25 years ago. I know, but like we we do a lot of uh, pregame, I guess you could say, for a pod. Like we have yeah. some conversations <clears throat> and we try not to like, as soon as we realize we've dug up like kind of this little gold nugget. Yeah. We try to stop, right? When we're having a good yeah. conversation. Whoa, whoa, whoa let's, ha let's save this for the pod. Right. Which we never do a good job of doing, but like we we try. Yeah, because you don't want to have the same conversation twice. That was one of those gold nuggets that I would have dug up in our a, a conversation off air, yeah, and then would never have been able to kind of recreate right on the pod. So I don't know. I just thought it was cool that to have one of those moments and that's cool get to know you a little bit better. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, what's strange is even though we recorded that two weeks ago, no one has actually listened to it at the time of this recording which is unusual usually we have the audio up within a couple days and the video up a week later and this past two weeks has just been a little abnormal yeah and that's nothing been... wrong with that though in fact it's kind of better is it kind why of why do you say well the... why so <laughs> why do you say someone, people are going to get uh content without like a huge break because they already went past the break. That'll and be nice. It doesn't make sense, does yeah, it? Yeah, it's only going to happen this time. Yeah. And in fact, we really try, especially the audio, we try to get it up because some of the stuff that we're talking about is topical. Like a couple of the items that we're going to be talking about today happened two weeks ago, one week ago, and then this week, right? Yeah. That's kind of the pace of things. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so. But I, as a preview... I, I, Sorry. The audio, well, go ahead. I just cut you off. As a preview, one of the things we're going to be talking about from this week is that you were at uh, TCT Rapid. Yes. Right? Rapid yep. TCT. Which is one of the reasons why we didn't record earlier in the week, because we probably would have tried. Yeah, maybe. Um, just to speed things up, but yes. I'm looking forward to hearing about that because I didn't go this year. It's a great show. I think the shows are probably picking up pace now over the past year. Uh, Rapid was. It was a great show. Okay, we're we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about it. I'm that's, looking forward to it. That's my little. Uh, that's my little plug. That's cool. It. I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing about it. 
So do we want to jump right into the news? Uh, we could, but I do want to say one thing. Today is my Friday. I'm, uh, okay. I'm so looking forward to not being here tomorrow. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, so my brother's getting <laughs> married on saturday okay today's thursday so you have to take a full day off before a wedding that's so not this even is yours one of the things i want to talk about just real briefly is when it comes to uh weddings it's strange how some weddings impose nothing on others and then other weddings are like a lot of people have to do a lot of things like a lot of time and energy and responsibilities yep. i don't think my brother listens to this so I'll just say, like, <laughs> it actually has been not bad at all, except for, like, the two days of the wedding and, like, the day before the wedding. It's just, like, a lot of run-throughs and stuff. So I, I have to take off work tomorrow to go through one thing. I'm going to take a mental note. If I ever get married, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that to people. <laughs> You'll see. You'll see. If you ever get married. Slim chance. Yeah, I am going to take advantage of having my day off, though. I'm going to go pick up a bunch of uh, compost, which I have somewhere to put it. Yeah, into the dirt. (laughs) So you've been moving dirt around with your new extra large bucket. Yeah. Shovel. Yeah. I got a dump trailer, too. And so now you've just got holes in the ground that you want to fill with compost. No, I'm I have all clay soil and I want to amend it goodness what you have to make it better and i learned a new thing you can buy bio waste compost okay like old carp from utah lake nope unless humans eat the carp oh my (laughs) goodness okay that's disgusting no it's not so enjoy that enjoy having my whole yard's gonna be full of it why are you so proud of this? Because it's efficient. <laughs> okay. Re- reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Yeah. It comes from the wastewater plants. We're so off track. I know. This is a, this is a printing podcast, print heads. Oh, look who's I talking. Have... <laughs> look who's talking. Anytime we start to talk about anything remotely printed, you're like, ugh, fine. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> that is not true. Hey, I got a couple comments at Rapid oh, on, on our yeah? podcast. I'm not going to share them. Solicited or unsolicited? I will share them with you off the air because... That sounds... It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt bad. Really? No. <laughs> no, there's one fragile. of them. <laughs> there's one that was pretty funny, memorable, but I won't do that to you on the air. Okay. Wow. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh this is going to make the episode so much easier to go through. <laughs> okay. Anyway, not let's conscious at all. <laughs> it was uh it was a Stratasys uh, person that commented on it and they oh. just, they like the delivery of our news, but they prefer one person over the other. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm well, totally one person. Here's you know. the thing. I, I really like what's happening with the podcast because at this point even with with the video i think even without it like the personalities shine through um it's the first time anyone in my life has recognized that i have a personality is that right yeah (laughs) who's the person all of them all the people (laughs) are like oh no you just you have a you have a way about you you. yeah absolutely yeah I, i i recognize that you have a personality no, you do. It's very little. You have a personality. Very small. <laughs> oh, yeah. You yeah. have a personality. Of course I do. I was told I was quirky. Really? The other day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm quirky. Hmm. What do you even do with that feedback? I, I really don't know. I don't know because I'm like, man, I've described people as quirky before and I feel like they were <clears throat> a lot different than me. But uh, I guess that's any, a category I fall in. Any feedback is... It we only it. means what whatever meaning you put to it sure anything yeah all right let's jump into the news yeah let's do that you were telling me about something am forward yep can you describe that to our listeners fill us in on what's going on okay i can try i can definitely try so and this actually uh this picks up where we left off last episode 
where we were talking about supply chain. Yeah. Supply chain. Um, we kind of teased that, didn't we? Well, we, we talked about it, but that conversation happened before this event. So two weeks ago now, you had uh, some representatives uh, of the administration, including President Biden and the uh, respected Ohio senators toured Oak Ridge National Laboratory and then also a local manufacturing plant to kind of announce the launch of a government-backed program called AM Forward, so Additive Manufacturing Forward. And <clears throat> they launched this and they talked about the importance of promoting manufacturing within the United States. They promoted the idea that innovation happens within manufacturing and that how important innovation has been for the success and continued success of the United States and also recognize that over the past several decades, maybe since the 1970s, manufacturing has more and more been exported, right? Manufacturing has largely left the United States and you're starting to see some, some of it come back. Why are you smiling like that? Can I? <laughs> You're going to have to say something now. Let me do this real quick. Okay. Listen. Here at Rockwell Automation's world headquarters, research has been proceeding to develop a line of automation products that establishes new standards. I know what quality, this is. Technological leadership Wait for and it. operating excellence. With customer success as our primary focus, work has been proceeding on the crudely conceived idea of an instrument that would not only provide. I know exactly what this is. For use in unilateral phase detractors but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal gram meters. <clears throat> Such an instrument comprised of Dodge gears and bearings. Yeah. Alliance electric motor so the, <laughs> I think I think the marketing department of pretty much every additive OEM used this as a as a case study for exactly what they think they should do. <laughs> I'm I'm just teasing that, but uh as you were talking that's what I was thinking yeah. about. What's the what's the name of the product ultimately that they're It's a Rock Rockwell Automation. Um, yeah. it's some sort of product. It's like Rock the discombobulator or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that what it is? Listen. It's a crudely it's a crudely desi developed concept. <laughs> and then he goes off for like half an hour. Yeah. I'm not going to get into it. Let's let's get back to this and then cuz that's going to be yeah. my YouTube of the day. Oh, okay, cool. I like that. So Anyway, with this AM, AM, forward. AM forward initiative, <clears throat> yeah, I had to break up your monologue. No, that's okay. It it helped me uh, better understand what I was actually talking about. <laughs> so it's right now the state the state of it is that it's basically an agreement between private industry and uh, public industry, not industry, but it's a private public compact. And it's totally voluntary for companies to participate. And they have four or five original uh, participants. So they're large OEMs. G Aviation, Honeywell, uh, Lockheed Martin, Siemens Energy, and Raytheon. Mm -hmm. So... All of these companies have agreed to different things in uh, in support of additive manufacturing stateside. So <clears throat> these large companies they they're largely uh, aerospace and defense companies, and so they build very complex machines, airplanes. You know, maybe two million parts on a on an airplane. And uh, they don't, the way these things are made is these companies don't make them all on their own, right? They have suppliers. And uh, you have this concept of tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers for these companies. Yes. 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 Continue. Okay. Continue. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I'm with okay. you. So let's say that uh, Lockheed is, is building F-35. Something like yep. that. Okay, so Lockheed wins a contract to build the F-35. They their engineers, you know, begin the design and whatnot. 
but they don't actually manufacture the vast majority of the parts. Something like on average, two thirds of the parts come through suppliers. And those suppliers are injection molding parts, they're bending sheet metal, they're creating forgings, and more and more they're 3D printing the parts. So especially in the climate uh, over the past two years, but more and more and more where people are having trouble getting parts supplied. And we found that there are issues in the supply chain where the vast majority of parts are coming from somewhere other than the United States. Uh, it's becoming problematic. So this is and but I think you'll agree with this. <clears throat> Very rarely do we hear about 3D printed parts coming from overseas. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, unless it's big. <clears throat> Occasionally those big parts, those large format prints. Yeah, yeah. And no, but then we're usually talking about Europe. I would say. I disagree. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's not my. It's occasional. It's not very often, but occasionally there's a company that gets large. It's basically someone who can <clears throat> deal with the lead times. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's not very often. Yeah. So I, I kind of just make that point because I don't, the, the main issue that this is looking to address, I don't think actually exists at the moment, but it's going to, like they're hedging against. So what I'm saying here is go back to 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, everything's being made here. Sure. Okay. And Including then, vegetables. Mm. I read a statistic the other day that said 40% of America's vegetables were homegrown during that era. Oh, wow. So a lot of people had gardens. Yeah. And they were good at it. Yeah. Made me sad. Only 40% though. Yeah. That's only? <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's still, it still wasn't the majority is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, so anyway... Um, fit during the 50s 60s manufacturing innovations are happening and once the companies uh started to perfect the technology they started outsourcing the technology looking for lower cost labor right and so at the time that probably sounded like a great idea but decades of that flow saw that a lot of the innovation was uh moving overseas as well a lot of the intellectual property was moving overseas as well and over the span of many many years you find yourself in a situation like that's kind of dire so what i'm saying here is that how are we not in that already we are but not with 3d printing is what i'm saying so largely 3d printing innovation is happening here in the u.s and the manufacturing is happening here in the u.s and when these companies go to their supply chain they're looking largely at U.S. companies. But the, the fear, the way I'm reading this, is that that may not be the case 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Does that make sense? So AM Forward, from my perspective, is an initiative to protect, protect U.S. interests from, that re from repeating history. It might make sense if I if I explain what the agreements are between these five manufacturers. Yeah, what their commitments are. It would make more sense. Yeah, I mean, I have a brief <clears throat> summary here that I read through. Um, widespread delays and shortages in low volume high mix parts. Mm -hmm. uh, inflation and factory closures. So this is what's that's the result of of what's happening. <clears throat> Yeah. Right now. Yeah. And that's not something you can just turn a knob and fix immediately, right? And it's the result of outsourcing the manufacturing. So what the initiative is, is these companies are making these voluntary public announcements that, that say when they go to their supply chain for parts, and specifically for additive parts, they're going to commit to a certain percentage of those parts coming from American companies. And it's, it, it changes depending on uh, the company. But for example, GE Aviation says 50% of the AM parts that they put out to their suppliers will go to 
smaller, medium sized companies based here in the US. And overall, 30% of their parts will stay here in the US. So I think that's a step in the right direction, but still only 30% they're committing to stay here in the US. <clears throat> so the way I understood what your take on this is, this is going to have an effect on future additive technology. My take on it is that it will slow the export of AM technology outside the U.S. AM technology development. Uh, just at, not. Or just parts. It, there is a component uh, to this that... Uh, incentivizes companies to do their research here in the U.S. So another aspect of the AM Forward initiative is that the U.S. government is going to reimburse OEMs that do research here in the U.S. at specific locations. So, that, for example, they're opening up Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and OEMs can come on site, do research there, and they'll be reimbursed by various programs, DOD, um, Etc. So they're promoting innovation here, one. But what I'm saying is when it comes to actual time to manufacture the parts, they're trying to keep as much of those that part manufacturing happening here in the U.S. That's kind of more the take I had. Just on my brief, brief reading right. here and then listening to you, I'm sure there's more I need to look into, like the commitments from the OEMs. But the summary of kind of how I... <clears throat> take this is this falls in line with our ram initiative here yeah sure is to help people small companies medium-sized companies with bridge to production and to recapture some of the business that they already do uh, and be able to produce some of those parts that they were exporting or or having produced sorry having produced overseas recapture that by producing them here right with am technology right and i think that's happening my fear is that and i think their fear is that it won't continue happening once you establish like this works here stateside then the fear is that it could it could be exported i see so i, see, I, see. I think the current climate is most of these suppliers are if they're printing parts they're being printed here in the u.s mm -hmm. but will that continue i I don't, my, my fear wouldn't be that it's exported because all the benefits of being able to produce it in house here is not having to have it shipped on a, on a boat. Yeah. You know, yeah. those lead times are horrendous. And right now, the only thing that you have going for you, if you do, uh, have this work done overseas is cost mm -hmm. cost. You don't, you don't benefit from time savings. So it's just cost. Yeah. Bringing it home, it's it's a higher cost. Sure. But it's a time savings, and that balance is why you do it. Yeah. It's a flatter curve. The the whole, or would you call it a flat <laughs> curve? It's just a flatter cost yeah. over time. It's not as steep right. as your investments into, say, like a casting mold or a machined tool. Sure. But when you look at the the business case for what these companies do, it's very profit driven, right? So if you can say, but that if you're going to have it shipped overseas, added time, then time, then it's even slower. Yeah, but time, and it's still flat. Time is not always a factor, right? Time's the biggest factor, baby. No, not yeah, always. You don't think? Not always. Not. It's not always. And. <laughs> Case in point, when I told you that some people send out for those large parts, I just don't think this is a solution for our current problems. If time, I don't think that we get so good at it here that all of a sudden we're paying people overseas to produce our parts additively. Maybe. Because we know it's not the fastest but if, option. If time was the biggest factor, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are in because people are putting up with longer lead times to get a cheaper price. They were. And now those lead times are way too long. They're, they still are, though. Because oh, man. don't you think with the, conver I, okay, I, the conversations, I, the conversations that, I have, that I've been having, people can't do it anymore. Now they have unpredictable lead times. Yeah. So they can't continue doing business with unpredictable lead times from their suppliers. 
this may be slower than what they they uh, are doing currently. It's faster, but it may be slower than what they used to do, but it's predictable. Yeah. And it's controllable. When it's in-house, they have the control. Now it's just a matter yeah, of proving that true. this technology will do what they need it to. And, uh, yeah, I agree with that. But I do know that <laughs> companies, companies, at least in my experience, that are sourcing their parts overseas or their tools overseas, they are very, very, very hesitant to uh, repatriate that knowing that it's going to be more expensive it's even if because it's their just entire, an interim their entire solution their entire business model is built around the cost of those parts coming from overseas so it is difficult to bring it back the it's cost difficult. of waiting though is so high that's why they're forced to do it but in in some cases they're losing money doing it and they're hoping that it's temporary it's an interim fix all I'm saying is there's a tolerance for waiting. <clears throat> and I think yeah. at this point in time, most people, most people's tolerances have been exceeded. Yeah. Um, they're not getting the parts in a timely manner. Yeah. So you can't make money if you've got assemblies on the shelf that can't be produced because they're waiting on one part. Sure. You can't sell those things until they're complete. Yeah. So you're totally. paying to have inventory that could be sold. Totally. Revenue, profits. Totally. So going back to AM Forward, uh, we talked about, um, you know, primarily this is a private-public partnership, but there's also some components within the, uh, within the initiative that would help small and medium companies gain the capital to purchase equipment and also some commitments from both OEMs and the government to help train people, provide technical assistance. So if we have a listener out there that wants to take part in this, how can they see if they qualify for some of this help? So it depends on what direction they're coming from. Uh, I don't know the exact answer to this, but let's just run through some scenarios. Okay. Let's say you are, let's just call out one of the companies that's not on this list, a large OEM, Boeing. Boeing's not on this list. So let's say someone within the additive division on Boeing or anyone within Boeing that has the clout to uh, say, hey, we're going to participate. They, they could sign up as a OEM and that would involve making some level of commitment to either uh, promoting innovation, promoting the supply of parts and or promoting the education. So I'm, I'm talking about the people who would be provided those parts or <laughs> education from these guys. Yeah. Okay. So then we're talking about people who would be somewhere in the supply chain mm -hmm. for these level OEMs. So yeah. you would have uh, tier one suppliers could totally participate. Tier one suppliers are the companies that are one level below the OEM and providing finished parts and or finished assemblies complex stuff uh so like total navigation system or something like that yeah. full engine okay so they could be participating and they might be participating in the sense of wanting some equipment so they could go to uh it's the astro website it's astro uh i found it did you find that mm -hmm. sure as heck and did. what does astro stand for i forget it's A-S-T-R-O-A dot org. Like American Science and Technology Research Organization. Is that what it is? Not research. Applied Science and Technology Research Organization of okay. America. <laughs> okay. Astro. Uh... Astro America. <laughs> okay. But the website is A-S-T-R-O-A dot org. Okay. Got it. Check it out. So there's a place to sign up there. And there is, and uh, you can put in your information and explain how do you want to participate. Um, you have tier two suppliers who is one step down the chain. They are supplying the parts and assemblies to the tier one suppliers. And this is where you start to become uh, probably a smaller company tier two. And then one step below that tier three, they're providing things like hydraulic fittings, tubing, like more low-level 
mainly parts. They supply stuff to the tier two. Tier two starts to assemble things, sub assemblies. They supply those to tier one. Tier one com composite all together. They supply the parts to the OEM. So uh, I think tier one, tier two is probably where the bulk of the interest would be. Actually, probably tier two, tier three would would be the bulk of the interest. People who are supplying parts. Well, think about it. We're printing parts, right? We're not printing assemblies. Yeah. So wouldn't it be tier one? Tier oh, tier one. Sorry, that's your uh, finished parts, your transmission. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big, big, big stuff. Okay. Yeah. I had it now complex parts. If you if you take a look at an engine, like a turbine engine or something, a lot of those parts could be printed. Whether or not that's happening at the tier one or the tier two level is probably variable. And I have read that there's a lot of pressure for tier two companies to consolidate and become more on the level of tier one companies. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to read more about this. this yeah. There's, there's going to be some lending programs through, um, SBA and USDA and DOD. Good. Yeah. Good access to capital and training and whatnot. So honestly, I think this is 10 years too late. I mean, not too late, but it should have happened 10 years ago. Yeah. It would have been nice Especially if, five years if ago. people were rolling with this <clears throat> yeah. prior to the pandemic. Oh, yeah, for sure. So it's done. It's it's spearheaded by America Makes. America Makes is a government organization that is responsible for promoting additive manufacturing within the U.S. America Makes was founded 10 years ago. So I guess that's that was a necessary first step. Sure. And when you have the president of the United States talking about 3d printing it's bound to gain some attention right and right yeah you'd hope so <laughs> you'd hope so you hope so and he's talking about 3d printing and it's not uh 3d printing guns like it's a positive there's positivity around the discussion well and it surrounds production yeah and manufacturing which is, yeah which is where we're headed yep it's where we want to be yeah so let's uh, let's move on. We don't have a ton of time. Um, we're gonna move toward another big piece of news. This okay. one was kind of fun, not funny, but we joked about naming conventions oh, yeah, 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 for yeah. these companies. But MakerBot and Ultimaker they agreed to merge uh, to accelerate global adoption of additive manufacturing. Yeah, and they got some money too. I didn't know this till I looked it up. Who got some money? They got some money them okay uh which what are they going to be called now is it ultim maker maker <laughs> yeah is it is it ultabot or maker maker ultim maker maker <laughs> i like ultim bot i think ultabot Ulta 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 so we're talking about okay, maker bot which was this which was owned by stratasys and ultim maker which is owned by an investment group yeah and they merged into a single company i think they're continuing with the ultimaker name for now but i think they should combine it to ultimaker Ult i think maker? ultabot 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 maker maker though that's it i like a, the yeah. maker maker it's maker, more maker. fun it is it's more way fun. more fun yeah it's they they <laughs> the new entity has secured additional funding of 62.4 million from uh, what I source i don't know um let's see a planned cash investment from stratasys it'll be backed by existing investors npm capital and stratasys okay yeah i don't think all of the details have been shared but my memory is that stratasys in terms of ownership would own about 45 percent of this new entity low 40s low 40s yeah and the big thing is new company leadership or reorganized com company leadership. So this may mean something to someone out there, but led by Nadav Goshen, that's the current MakerBot CEO, uh, Jurgen Von Hollen, that's the current Ultimaker CEO. Oh, they're doing like and a- And he'll act as co, yeah, they'll act as co-CEOs. You don't like that? <clears throat> uh, that's, that's pretty rare. Nadav will be managing the R&D, and then Jurgen will be managing the commercial- Yeah aspects that's of it. strange it's strange it's gonna be 
there may be some growing pains, but they they're I I read somewhere that they're really reorganized leadership in a yeah. way that will yeah. improve these two, which is so what, what do you we expect wanna, what to do we see think in a press this? release? What do we think of this? <sighs> Can I be frank? <laughs> yeah, that's what this pod is for. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care because they're two machines that, like, we like MakerBot. Uh, it's a clean-looking benchtop unit. I think we can all be pretty honest about that. It's <coughs> it's a prosumer model, which both of these printers have played yeah. in that space yeah. for a while. And it's a space, if I'm to be honest, I think just needs general improvement to encroach upon, like, a true industrial-type <laughs> machine. We We know the difference. Right. When you use an industrial machine, it's not the same experience sure. as with a prosumer model or a benchtop model. And for at least my short time here in the additive industry, prosumer models have been confusing <clears throat> to people. Yeah. Because it's kind of these unfulfilled promises like, hey, here we are. We're the middle ground. It's a super, super expensive. Yeah. You can look at it as a super expensive benchtop unit. So the expectations are just humongous yeah from a benchtop user because they've invested so much more and these are accessible to your everyday joe schmuckatelli yeah as well as a company a legitimate engineering or r&d program might think this is a low-cost industrial machine right so the messaging has been confusing i think the performance overall of the machine hasn't been so much better from a benchtop unit that it that that it's really justified that's maybe too much Maybe well, I shouldn't have said that. No, I mean... Hopefully that, I'll be back next episode. We can't be canceled. <laughs> yeah, <we> can. <laughs> That's going to come back to haunt us. I know. My, my. I know. So I, I think I agree that transitional segment is a tough space to be in because you are up against hard limits on your cost. If, if the cost of your product starts to rise, then you're com suddenly you're competing in a different space and you are abandoning your user base. You can go lower, but you can't just magically make your product lower cost. Like you have cost inputs into your product. And we've talked, there's, we had at least one whole episode dedicated to where does the extra zero come from on the cost of some of these machines. And some of it is just hard cost of the quality of the components and the cost to develop the software. So they the machines in that space are trying to they're trying to optimize value is really what they're trying to do but they are making some concessions and so it it disappoints people who are coming from the commercial want and it kind of disappoints the people who are coming from the consumer but there's side a silver well. lining and you just made me think of it with them combining forces and having both kind of played in the exact same space yeah there's going to be some redundancy which is going to stink for the employees right like now i have to work with a new team <laughs> or there's some consolidations yeah that's true but in terms of like slicing and software and that sort of thing either one figure out a way to combine the two or let's decide yeah. which one of these we're going to use all right so now those costs that you save in now i don't have two separate groups developing two separate slicers for example yeah. now i have one those engineers or that money can then be reallocated to hopefully hardware improvements machine improvements r d whatever it is like maybe we'll see a better machine yeah so what do you think each side wants from the other side <laughs> i don't know i don't know what do you have I can I tell think, you're thinking of something. Already. I have a few thoughts. And again, I don't use an Ultimaker, but we see a, we do see a lot of Ultimakers. I can think of one thing. What? Ultimaker wants the Stratasys name and backing. I would say the opposite. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is making for some great I radio. Know, right? <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> uh, let me explain that. Okay, please. Okay. <laughs> Please do, because if you don't, canceled. Okay. okay. Yeah. Tomorrow. That's true. <laughs> so think about who their buyers are. Okay. okay. 
and think about the reputation of each of those brand names within just that segment. Look at the market share within just that segment. Ultimaker is outselling MakerBot in that segment. And I would say the Ultimaker brand is more valuable in, within that segment than the MakerBot brand. That's my thinking. I think okay. the MakerBot brand value has gone up and down over the last 13 years, quite a bit. And so I think that the fact that this deal even happened is evidence of that. Think about Stratus has purchased MakerBot, right? Yeah. Why? So they could own that entry level space. Yeah, because it was a valuable space that was growing in popularity and it was the entry point into the commercial space. So if you don't have any machines in that space, either you have to get into the space or try to convince people that that space isn't worth having. So they bought MakerBot and they paid a large sum for MakerBot. And they improved the product, but when they did that, they largely abandoned the user base of that system at that time, right? As you can watch in the Netflix documentary. Print the legend. Print the legend. Yeah. They did. So a lot of people who were- were sad folks. Yeah, right, because you have the big corporate giant. Well, it was open source <laughs> prior to that. No, that's not true. You had Is that right? Yeah, that is right. Okay. So you had <laughs> That's all you had to say. Jeez. Rep no. I I'm, I'm just trying to I, I'm trying I to could get my back thoughts. check you. You had RepRap which was open source and then you mm -hmm. had the original make MakerBot that was built off the open source and was like quasi open source. Um but then MakerBot developed more models and closed closed it. And then that was a lot of the controversy is, hey, you built this off an open source platform, now you're closed, and then later, and that caused some issues, and then now you're selling, that caused even more yeah. controversy. And so you could actually blame some of the loss in brand value to the original MakerBot team, I would say. So anyway, we see more and more Ultimakers out there in the field. Um, we see them as we come in later, and they're like, hey, we have this Ultimaker, it did this and this and this for us, but we need more. So then that's what brings us in typically. And that's valuable, right? To Absolutely. say, hey, this is the entry point in there. But I think that within the space, Stratasys, Stratasys is investing in Ultimaker. I mean, ultimately, that's the structure of the deal, right? If they own 40 to 45% of the company, they're an investor into Ultimaker, not the other way around. So wouldn't that signal to you that they saw value in the brand? Well, of course. That's my whole point. So I think <laughs> I think Stratasys I think Stratasys I think Stratasys was likely saying, hey, we still want to be in the space, we still think it's valuable. But we don't want to. We don't want to fight Ultimaker. I think the Ultimaker side is saying, "Hey, we want some of the technology that's in the MakerBot ecosystem." And you do have assets like Thingiverse, which is a MakerBot asset, Cura, which is the slicer for Ultimaker. I think all of those could combine into a pretty sweet product, but it's still playing in a space that's just a strange, it's a strange space. I do care. I take back my original statement. You, you went care. right up to the microphone and you said, I don't care. I, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, initially I'll care. <laughs> not initially. I'll care when there's change. The proof's in the pudding, baby. Yeah, actually very little's changed right now. Yeah, like I mean, they're probably at this point, they're probably saying, hey, it's business as usual. We're figuring out the fine details of how yeah. this is going to work. Yeah. I I mean, the MakerBot stuff is largely off our radar. Uh, but we 
you can you can go to our website and buy MakerBot. A year from now, will you be able to go to our website and buy Ultimaker? I don't know. Maybe. Will it or be maybe not. an Ultimaker maker? It'll be a it'll be an Ultibot. A maker maker maker. It'll be a maker maker. Buy maker maker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm sure whoever whoever it was that you were referencing earlier from Stratasys that has some opinions, I'm sure they're going to love that segment. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think it's great. I love walking into a shop and seeing an Ultimaker there. I love seeing a MakerBot there. So do I. Because if we're there, that means that they want something more. More of a good thing. Too much of a good thing is a good thing. I have a um, something I gotta say. Okay. It's in. Can you hear that? Am I shaking? Am you're I shaking. shaking the desk? Too yeah, much? you're shaking the desk. I apologize. So, when do you want to get into the the rapid stuff? Well, I think we are going to have to preview it and just like hit some of the highlights. To, That's all I need. And this, then we this can one talk. I just need highlights. Did you see the part? The part that was the buzz of the internet. No. Oh, the, wait, is it the banana? No. Dang it. The buzz of all the internet in the past week. What? What is it? I haven't been on the internet in the last week. Yeah, but the part was there at Rapid. Tell me about the part and I'll tell you if I saw it. I probably didn't. <laughs> an arrow spike. Like no. an algorithmically uh, designed arrow spike. No. Mm. Who made it? It was a joint project between EOS and uh, Hyperganic. Okay. Very cool part. So that's what I was going to tell you. Not to disappoint you, but I did not. We were very busy. Okay. I did not get a chance to wander around too much. Oh, really? So I had to be super targeted with where I went you and were, who I saw. You were working the booth. Yeah, I was. And uh, On the front lines. That's right. Boots <laughs> on the ground, baby. Yeah. And Which is fun, but it's so exhausting. It is. And I'm a little tired from it still. I've got kind of like the trade show hangover going on. Yeah. It's just like, oh my gosh, I talked to so many people about everything. Um, we had a scanning guy that was there, but he's also a salesman. So yeah. unfortunately <clears throat> he was taking calls, uh, not at the booth, but he would have to leave intermittently. Yeah. And then I'm filling in for the scanning guy. He was so, running the micro, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, he was. The micro from our tech. Yep. Which is a cool just, little... That's the little standalone machine, and it's got a fixture and a turntable. Yeah, five-axis uh, scanner. Really cool. It is cool. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't get to see a ton of stuff. However, there were some highlights for me. Um, I went to the Exact Metal booth. Of course, they're a partner of ours, so I wanted to say hello, and I got to see the new machine. Cool. In person. Yeah. Um, I think it's really cool that they're committed to keep that same price point on the new machine. Yeah. Obviously that made their old machine sales suffer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I, I just think it's cool. They're committed to a price point. Um, I agree. That's something you don't see super often. So I really, really like that. Um, they hinted at maybe something new that's going to hit a different price point. So excited for that to be released. Um, there was this other company that flew under the radar for me. I've been living under a rock. Okay. Um, who won the Dean, the Dino award or Dino award? Uh, are you going to, to say fortify? No. Are you going to say, Oh, well the Dino awards this year was Ben. Mm -hmm. And, um, who does Ben work for fortify? No, not Fortify. Um, hold on, hold on. It's amazing to me that you even know this. Like, you're even going to attempt. <sighs> it starts with an F, right? Nope. What? Nope. All right, who is it? It's on the tip of my tongue. Tritone. Oh. Tritone? Tritone. Did he just start there? I think so. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I never heard of Tritone. So. So, so get a load of this, all right? Um, I go to Tritone, and this is a pretty different machine okay. than I've ever seen. It's I don't know if you'd call it a carousel or a turret, but 
it's got six different stations. Imagine a rotisserie type tray with four different workstations. There are six processes going on at one time. Okay. It's a metal uh, additive machine, and it's using powder paste. Okay. And it's also using like a wax type support structure. Okay. It does need to be sintered, but the idea behind it is that the sintering stage, there's far less shrinkage. Why? So going from like 10 to 20, or sorry, from 20-ish, which is pretty common to a close to 10 Did they explain? Did, did they explain that? Uh, ben gave me a really high level okay. overview. I think it has something to do with the homogenous paste. Interesting. Uh, kind of how they're how how they're he, applying. It. He was in the trenches in this technology. Yeah, and he's what a cool guy. He, I like him. What a really he is a good like, dude. Cool guy. Um, so to have that discussion with him, to be able to see this machine, if you want to learn more about it, just search Tritone. Tritone. But so why is, where does that name come from? It's real hard telling. Three of what? There's got to be three of something. Yeah, you'd imagine it's based on three of something, but there's six. Mm. So, um, yeah. Ben Arnold. Yeah, I know Ben. He had a cool hat. Yeah, Anyhow, he's always got that cap on. Yeah, so I got to see that machine. I got to see it in operation. One of the cool things about it that I thought was cool, it has the ability to kind of fly cut an old layer off. Okay. So if they're, it, it's doing some, oh, uh, what's kind of like a quality control layer to layer. Okay. So it has the ability to see, oh, I didn't lay down a good layer. Let me fly cut this off. We'll reapply the layer. Very, very fine layer heights as well. Part densities are right in line with what you would expect from a DMLS machine over 98%. And yeah. DMLS is higher than that. Like 99 point something. 0.5 would be on they're, the low end. They're in that range. Okay. So they're on... <laughs> 98 and a half I so, think but it makes the, green parts yes does and make then green parts. do they close the loop on those or how do you finish these parts uh yeah the so the parts come off the machine so the yep. sintering process is not happening in that as it exchanges yeah so but do they have a product for that or we what didn't do they talk do? about that it's the most important part is the most important part. <laughs> you can make the prettiest green part ever. And it could be immaculate. Which a lot of people can do. It's getting, nowadays, it's getting nowadays to the part. people can do that. Yeah. It's not the hardest part. So, but maybe they have a solution. We don't know. Yeah. Look it up. Try tone. I'm just trying to tell you what piqued my interest. I walked by the booth, had a cool discussion. Yeah. Got to meet an influential member of the additive space. And so I thought that was cool. That is cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, there were some other machines out there that I thought were kind of neat. Nothing, nothing crazy new. Did you tell him we talked about him on the pod? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I said, congratulations on, on the Dino award, the <laughs> Dino. And, uh, he, he was j just humble, nice guy. Yeah, he's a good like dude. you can tell, He's super passionate about it. All right. You could have plugged our pod, but you know, whatever. I was afraid. <laughs> Why would I? He's I so much cooler than us. Um, oh, you don't think so? <laughs> <laughs> just my face. Yeah. He's, uh, he was, he's just a really humble, like sharp, sharp yeah, dude. He's a good guy. So are we going to talk? Is there anything else or we, should we save it? I got for to next see week? the banana, the What's Stratasys the? banana made out of the new materials. Oh, the flexible, uh, Colors, uh, the co C yeah, C M Y, Agilis, Agilis. So that what was about pretty the face? neat. Did you touch the face? Heck no, I'm not going to touch that thing, even though I touched <laughs> the banana. But the face is just creepy. Yeah, super creepy. I'm trying to think of another highlight that I saw. There are some. Oh, I remember one. I uh, can't remember the company name. I'll give it to you on the next episode. But there's a company out there doing metal finishing on additive components, with most metal additive people 
there are companies that have concerns about finishing, getting to like that mirror finish. And sometimes it's not something you can machine. Yeah. Because, right, we're creating parts that are yeah. unmachinable <laughs> a lot of times or very difficult to machine. There's a company out there that's doing a chemical electrolysis process, and they were doing it live action there. That's cool. And it was really cool to see. It's a subtractive process. Was it REM? No. It's Australian. Hmm. An Australian company. And their goal is to ultimately get purchased, hopefully, by an OEM or a post-processing company. Oh, which reminds me of the last thing I want to talk about. Um, and again, I will follow up on that. I'll tell you the company name. Really cool. Uh, Die Mansion. I got to see everything that we're about to get yeah. here prior to getting it. So yeah. I got to see the PowerShot S and PowerShot <clears throat> C. And I also got to see the dying machine. DM60. Yep, which was pretty cool. Everyone at the Die Mansion booth was wearing the dyed uh, shoes. The, oh, the yeah. Adidas shoes that were yeah. produced on the carbon printer, but they had all kind of chosen their own dye color. So oh, they all kind cool. of had these colored shoes. So it's really cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. But those were those are kind of the highlights. <laughs> Again, there was a ton of cool stuff there. Some of it's been there, seen that. The LSAM machine is always a big, the what big machine? draw. LSAM, it's that huge machine that prints like boat holes and stuff. It's pellet fed. Oh. It makes a ton of noise when it's there because you can hear the pellets like getting vacuumed up into the hopper. Yeah. But so cool. It's so cool to see. Um, I can't imagine there's a million applications out there for it. But uh, just when you see a printer that's that big. Yeah. How can it not draw you in? Well, they just need to start printing plastic houses and then they'll start selling machines like bananas. <laughs> Hopefully. So that's kind of the the very... High level cool. overview. All right, cool. Well, we'll we'll have to tackle more of it next week. I'll hit up the other guys that were there because yeah. I think between all of us that were there having our targeted kind of visits, there were probably some some other highlights, and hopefully I can kind of regurgitate right those. Right on. Well, is there anything else? No. Nothing. Well, that YouTube of the day, it was funny. My little brother is actually who brought it up. He uh, shared a meme with me. Okay. That had that audio. And I was like, do you know the, where that audio comes from? The do, Rockwell Automation. Audio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, no, I've never heard it. So famous. Yeah. And I was like, it's very big in engineering circles. Like it's made its rounds a million times over. And it's fun to play in front of sales guys. Because they tune out instantly. When I, they don't catch that it's a joke till yeah. like three quarters of the way through. Yeah. Because they're used to hearing some of those technical terminologies, just that overall jargon. Yeah. And tune out instantly. So it's not until it people start going. laughing that they start to think like, oh, maybe I should. This is a joke. Like, maybe I should yeah. listen. Like, what's the joke? And then they start to get it. Yeah. And my little brother, he's a salesman. So it was just funny. Um, I, I sent him a link to that full video so he could watch it all the way through. And he texts me back just dying laughing at the little compartment. When the guy opens the <laughs> compartment, there's a little squeak and he uses his hands to like try and further explain or demonstrate yeah. the words he's using. Yeah. And it, dude, so funny. If you haven't seen it, look up the Rockwell automation jargon video on YouTube. Super funny. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's it. That's all I got. All right, print heads. That's it for this week. And thank you for sticking with us. Thank Wait, you for I have an ad okay. from from a new company. Oh, you do? Yeah. How much are you getting paid? Um, that's I can't share that okay, information. Read it. Hey print heads. Yes, you Mr. Smarty Smart Pants Engineering Man. I'm talking <laughs> directly to you. <laughs> when was the last time you smelt the labor of your hard work? Can you even remember the last time you had to use some heavy grit soap after you finished a tough job? We didn't think so. You've been hiding behind your computer screen, designing and sending the interns to run your additive manufacturing machines. It's time to get back into the print lab and get back to being a manly prototyping man. Welcome to the latest artisanal 3D printer, Arcadius Maximus. <laughs> Arcadius is a joystick-driven instant feedback artisanal additive manufacturing machine. Use the eight-way Hap Suzami joysticks to design the 2D top-down view of your layer and hit the fire button. Boom! Sound effect. 
to apply directly <laughs> to the print bed. I wasn't supposed to read that. Draw the next layer and fire directly uh, to the print bed. Arcadius Maximus, the first freehand style artisanal additive manufacturing machine in existence, brought to you by the honorable folks at Juicy Filaments. So I guess Juicy Filaments is now producing a pretend machine. All right. But I, I have, I take issue with this. Uh, the first, I knew it. The first it's manual, sexist. manual, manly printer was the three doodler. <laughs> That's it. The three doodler the is three doodler. beautiful. Please look that up. That's an actual machine. The yep. three doodler is a real thing. It's a real thing. It exists. They even have a medical model. <laughs> so look it up. <laughs> okay, gotta go. Okay, see ya.